Let's open the scriptures now to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31. As I said earlier in the service, this afternoon's sermon is a belated Mother's Day sermon. We didn't have an opportunity to preach a Mother's Day sermon because we had the Lord's Supper on Mother's Day and then there was a pulpit switch the week after that and last Sunday was Pentecost. So we're using the opportunity now to preach a Mother's Day sermon, a sermon for mothers and wives, for all of us, but a reminder to of God's gift of virtuous women in our homes and in our congregation. So to that end, we'll read Proverbs 31, and our text, which I will not reread, is verses 10 through 31. The Word of God in Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. And now begins our text. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. 
Thus far we read the infallible and inspired scriptures. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts today and this week. Proverbs 31, beloved, is a model of what verse 10 calls the virtuous woman. The book of Proverbs elsewhere says much about the kind of women that men are to avoid. The impure woman whose mouth is a deep ditch and who is a narrow pit and all that are abhorred of the Lord shall fall into it, according to Proverbs 22, verse 14. Even if she's not impure, there are other women the Proverbs warns, warn against who for certain uh, faults of character may destroy the peace of their husbands and their family's house by contention or by being fretful in Proverbs 27, verses 15 and 16 say it's better to dwell in a corner of a rooftop than with such a woman in a wide or broad or big house. Proverbs 11, verse 22 says great beauty combined with lack of discretion is uh, such a woman is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. But all of these warnings against the kind of women men are to avoid are to highlight and to set in relief and to allow to shine more brightly the great gift and value and importance of godly and good women. Proverbs 14 verse 1 says it is the wisdom of a woman who builds her house. What the homes of the church are, the church is. And it is the woman's, the wife, the mother's high and beautiful calling to make the homes what they are. She is, according to Proverbs 17, verse 16, the fountain of honor. And Proverbs 18, verse 22 says to every Man whom God in his goodness and in his grace gives a godly and good woman to as a wife. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. Proverbs 19 verse 14 says that honor and riches are the inheritance of fathers. That Those are things Houses and riches and a kind of earthly honor are things that fathers can pass to their sons. But a prudent wife or a wise or excellent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs 31 verses 10 through 31 uses all of the colorful and imaginative devices of Hebrew poetry to emphasize the beauty and the, the excellence of the good and godly woman. It is what is called an acrostic. Verses 10 through 31 are an acrostic poem, which means that each verse begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And when you consider that this was instruction from a mother to her son, According to verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, it's not so strange that this kind of device would be used because it was used to help those who were taught memorize what they were taught. This would have been something that would have helped King Lemuel remember what his mother taught him. And even though in our version that idea of the acrostic poem is lost, the beauty of the language and of the words still remains and still emphasizes the beauty of the good and godly woman whose portrait is painted here. And the idea of these verses is to paint a practical 
virtues that operate day by day in the life of a godly wife and mother. They are like these verses are so many leafy branches waving fruit before us. And not till the end do we find the fountain of these fruits. Verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So let's consider this passage of God's word under the theme, a good and godly woman. We'll notice first her identity, second her characteristics, and third her reward, or who she is, what she looks like, and what is her reward. Who is this Proverbs 31 woman? Proverbs 31 verses 10 through 31 is as probably widely known as it is misunderstood. It's safe to say that if you've read anything on these verses in recent years, more than a little of what you have seen presents this as the woman who does it all. The Proverbs 31 woman is the woman who does it all, a kind of wonder woman. She runs a thriving business. She has a career. She makes something of herself. She parents her children. She keeps up with their schooling. And to boot, she's able to keep her husband satisfied. Ten years or so ago, this, she may have been touted as the woman who baked bread in her home with flour that she milled herself, had a clean house, and raised her kids to be familiar with chore charts and schedules, and had a hot meal on the table for her husband when he came home from work. Or a generation ago, this may have been touted as the woman who canned, and who grew food in her own garden and who canned for lean times, who patched and repatched her children's clothes so that nothing would go to waste, and hung clothes on the line and washed windows while singing to herself. But all of these descriptions, and you can find more, miss the point, miss the gospel point of this passage. This passage does talk about what the virtuous, what the excellent woman does. And we will talk about those as we get into her, especially the characteristics of this woman. But what the focus is on is her identity, who she is. Not so much what she does, but who she is. Her identity. And her identity, you have to understand, is the identity of every child of God. A saved sinner. A renewed, believing child of God who believes in God's wise plan for the forgiveness of her sins and is equipped with God's grace for the doing of his will in her life. This passage really has nothing to do with being excellent in homemaking. It has a lot to say about that, but that's really not the point. The point is that this woman's identity is hid with Christ in God. The Proverbs 31 woman is, is not a woman who is striving to carry the burden of her own or others' unrealistic expectations and left feeling burnt out and less than and discouraged. She isn't one who tells herself she needs to be a P31 woman and who tries but fails daily to live up to that standard. In fact, her identity is not in what she is in her own eyes or her husband's or her children's, although the passage talks about that, or anyone else's. Her identity is not legalistic performances, but that God loved her 
so much from eternity that he sent his perfect and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, the true wisdom into the world to pay the price for all her sins and failings, who died on the cross for her to shatter every legalistic expectation and says to her, my daughter, give me your heart. This is the Proverbs 31 woman. This is her identity. Her life is hid with Christ and God. Her identity is a child of God, renewed, believing, blood-bought, thankful, and God-fearing. We may say some things from a practical point of view about her identity as well. She is a wife. She has a husband. She has her husband, the husband that God has given to her, that God has given her to as he brought Eve to Adam. And this, of course, does not leave out of view single women, single because they've never been married or single because of, of God's providence in their life. This applies just as much to single women. The identity of this woman is she is a wife. Secondly, she is also a mother. She has children, verse 28. She has a household, which includes children and servants, verse 15. Again, this does not leave out of view wives to whom it has not been God's good pleasure to give children. Married women without children are as virtuous and excellent in the eyes of God as any woman to whom it is his pleasure to give children because their identity is the same, you understand. Their life is hid with Christ in God. It's not dependent on what others see of them whether they have children or not. They too are beloved of God, bought with Christ's blood, and equipped by God's grace for the doing of his will. And in their lives, those, the lives of women who have no children of their own, God gives opportunities to be a blessing to the children of others. That secondly. And third, practically, about the identity of this woman, she is a woman of experience. The passage talks about children and a home and certain activities of this woman, buying a field and, and making coverings and bringing girdles that she has made to the merchant that speak of a woman of experience. This is not a standard for a new bride. The idea of this passage is that it is a description of what a good and godly woman grows into over the course of the life of her sanctification through the grace of God and the movement of the Holy Spirit and may not exactly be the woman her husband marries or the new bride that she is when they first marry a woman of experience. Such a woman, says our text, is far above rubies in price, far above any earthly treasure. And the immense value placed upon the virtuous woman is unmistakable. If anyone reads the Bible and comes away with the thought, with the notion, with the with the idea that women aren't appreciated and valued, that the scripture doesn't have much good to say about women, this passage gives the lie to that notion. This woman is treasured 
She's treasured by God, she's treasured by her family, and she's treasured by God's church. She's treasured because of her identity in Christ. Now, what does this woman look like? What are her characteristics? The wife of, or the mother of King Lemuel describes the virtuous woman, the excellent woman in great detail for her son. She goes into much specificity with regard to the characteristics of this excellent woman. so that her son would appreciate what a great gift a godly and good woman is. As we examine these characteristics now that King Lemuel's mother and the real author of Proverbs 31, who is the Holy Spirit, gives, let's remember this is not a to-do list. These detailed virtues and characteristics are the fruit of a heart that is in the fear of the Lord, that reverences God with holy awe and love because he first loved her and her Savior, Jesus Christ, the promised wisdom who would redeem her. These are the fruit of God's love and Christ's death and the Holy Spirit's grace in her. None of these virtues is to be singled out and pursued in and of itself But the Proverbs 31 woman is a God pursuer herself and the virtues or characteristics are the outflowing of that, are the fruit that blossoms in her life as a result of the fear of the Lord. In other words, the detailed description of the characteristics of the excellent woman are to be understood as all the ways she strives to be pleasing to God as a thankful believer. Her goal is not to please her husband, first of all. Her goal is not to satisfy and meet all of the needs or be all things to her children. She's not a slave to her kids, nor is she a slave to her virtue-listing mother-in-law, if it comes to that but she pursues and strives to please God, and that is what makes her, with all of her virtues, such a blessing to her marriage, to her family, and to the church. Now let's examine uh, briefly six, six characteristics of the virtuous woman. I recognize that This is somewhat artificial, somewhat of an artificial list that tries to bring together uh, many verses in verses 10 through 31 that have the same idea or say the same thing with different examples or different language. So I understand that six things is perhaps not an exhaustive list, but I hope that it will be effective for us and for our wives and and mothers, and for our single uh, young women especially, or as well, in understanding what this passage is saying about what the good and godly woman looks like in her life and in relationship to others in her life. So first of all, she is trustworthy. She's trustworthy. Verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that she hath so that he shall have no need of spoil and verse 12 she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life and verse 23 her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land and this is first because it is foundational marriage is the foundational institution. Marriage is not conceived by man and therefore may not be changed by man and his laws and his courts and his government policies. But marriage is the the design, is the idea of God and it is to be practiced and lived according to his revealed will. 
the virtuous woman, godly wife, mother, understands that. Marriage is God's institution. And marriage is the foundation of the home and of the family and of the church and of every institution of society. So that, that she is trustworthy is foundational to her characteristics. In other words, her husband can have faith in her judgment. He can trust her to make wise choices and behave with wisdom. He can rest. She's his confidant and his counselor. Her advice is of more value to him than that of many uh, worldly wise or intellectually intelligent people. Her heart is so connected to his that she knows how he thinks and acts. She can finish his sentences and anticipate his words before he opens his mouth. The husband, though he seems to be strong and self-reliant, is really held up or strengthened by the pillar that is his wife. The fact that he trusts in her means that his wife is prudent and worthy of his trust as a partner, as the help fitting for him which God has given to him. And his confidence in his wife extends to his emotions, since his heart and not just his mind trusts in her. You see that his heart, the heart of her husband, does safely trust in her. And of course, the heart of her husband He's a believing husband, trusts in God, but that's the idea of this is that a godly woman is trustworthy to her husband, trustworthy for him. She is a rock on which he can lean. He goes out to his calling in the day, he goes to his work, and it is maybe weighty work, it may be uh, tedious work, it may be work that involves many cares, and he brings those home, and his wife helps them unravel those cares and those thoughts and those emotions. They can get pretty tangled up in a man's heart and mind. So to have someone who can help make things clear is truly a gift from the Lord. As one who is trustworthy, she's a blessing to her husband. That's the idea of verse 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. It is this strong and sweet home life that is a blessing to husband and to the family. She enhances her husband's life and does good things for him. She doesn't expose his weaknesses to others when she's out for brunch with her girlfriends, but she does him good. She speaks well of him. And that increases his influence outside the home. Verse 23 gets to that idea. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. This is Old Testament language for a man who is well known, who, um, it, whose name is, is known. The gates were the place where judgment was given and where important business was conducted. So if you were known in the gates, you were known as someone who could be trusted and who was a man of character and a man of integrity. And that's how the husband of the virtuous woman is known, not because, or, or not overtly because of her, but when that is traced back to its source, and people ask, why is this man known in the gates? Why is this man one who sits among the elders of the land? Why is his, why is his name a name of integrity and, and honor? Probably because 
He has that kind of woman at home. And this, of course, is not to say that every husband is a man who is known in the gates, who sits among the elders of the land, a man whose husband trusts in his wife, even when she does him good and not evil all the days of his life. We'll come to that too, but the comfort and the promise is that God understands that that is the fruit of his work, that that is the fruit of faith, and that is performed to his glory even when there, that is a thankless task as regards one's husband or one's family. She's a blessing to her husband because she is trustworthy and his heart can safely rest in her. And that again, this is a woman of experience. That in the first years of marriage or when husband and wife are young, there's, there's the energy and there's the vigor of youth and there's the physical attraction and there's all kinds of things that draw husband and wife together that make a husband want to be worthy of his wife's love. But as they mature and as they grow older and as they go through life together, this is proven by the experiences and by the trials and by the uh, afflictions and disappointments of life that God leads them through together and also the joys and happiness that God gives them together. So that as beauty fades, because beauty does fade, and is deceitful from that point of view. And charms, which is what beauty in verse 30 really means, charms are vain. Those fade, those go away. The hair that was colored once turns gray. The cheeks that were full become wrinkled. The eyes that were bright may become dull. But the love that is in the heart matures. The trust that her husband places in her is strengthened through the experiences of life. So she is trustworthy. Secondly, she is a hard and eager worker. She's industrious. Verses 13 and 15 and 17 through 19 and 27. Verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Verse 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Verse 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. In addition to all the invaluable treasures of love and conversation, of counsel and criticism and encouragement that she gives to her husband, this woman, the God, good and godly woman, is a positive source of wealth. She's a house manager. He may earn the bread, but when it comes into her hands, it is though it is miraculously multiplied into food to feed the family. When his money comes into her care, it is seemingly transformed from silver into gold to provide for the necessities of the family and, is, and to make their home life a comfortable one. She is industrious. She's eager to work. She's not lazy. She rises up early in the morning and her candle, her light, or her lamp does not go out by night. She is motivated. She works with a heart for her family and not for herself. Verse 15 is important because it indicates that this woman is not the kind of woman who does it all. She has maidens. She has maidservants. She has helpers. She doesn't place on herself the expectation that she must do everything and be everything to her family. She seeks help when she needs it. 
but to that help she gives a portion or direction is literally what that means. She gives direction so that that help can be used to the profit of her husband and family and household. She's also a motivated, her motivation is seen in, in the long hours that she keeps. She rises up early, she stays up late, and that isn't to say that you must be an early bird or a night owl, that you must be one or the other or both. That's not, the word of God here is not establishing a time clock, but the principle, the spiritual moving power that is being set forth here is don't lose sight of the grace of God that gives you the strength to be an early riser or to be a night owl in the service of your husband and your family and to do the work that God has called you to do. The motivation of this woman fuels hard work. And again, this is clothed, this is set in Old Testament language. So verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She sought wool, wool from sheep, flax, which, was, which could be anything from uh, uh, coarser cloth to make outer clothing or, to, or other materials to make different kinds of clothing and worked willingly with her hands. The point of that is, is she did what was necessary for the help of and the support of her family. In verse 19 again, we have Old Testament language. She layeth her hands to the spindle, that's to the spinning wheel, and her hands hold the distaff, which was an instrument for making a a roll of yarn or a roll of, of thread for sewing clothes at a later date. And again, that has passed away. We don't use spinning wheels. We don't use distaffs. That's not the point. The point is she, she worked. She labored faithfully with the materials and the tools and the strength that God gave her and her calling to be a wife and mother. This woman is also resourceful and stewardly. That comes out in verses 14 and 16. And again, this is all part of her as an industrious, uh, willing, and working woman. Verse 14, she is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. And verse 16, she considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planteth a vineyard. She's resourceful. You see that she's not the kind of woman who grows her own food in her back garden and who's always canning it for the leaner times. She brings her food from afar. She goes to different grocery stores to get the food that is necessary for her family. And like merchant ships or like her container ships today is the idea. She brings it home to provide for the needs of her household. She is resourceful and she's stewardly. She uses the gifts that God has given to to the family through the labor of her husband and through her own work faithfully for the help and support of the home. So she considers a field and she buys it. And again, this is Old Testament language and many make much of the fact that she buys a field and many will say that she buys this field with funds that she earned herself, and that may be true. But the point of that verse, I think, is found in the words that with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. In other words, she doesn't just look to get things, but she utilizes them, she uses them. In creative and imaginative ways, for the help, the support of her house and family. She's a resourceful and stewardly woman. 
She's well prepared. Again, this belongs to her being industrious. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. And verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She's prepared. She looks to the future and says, what will my family need? What will my children need? What, will, what, what must I plan to provide? At, in this season or in that season. She makes sure that those things are to hand and at the appropriate time, she produces them for her family. And so she may not be afraid. Literally, she may laugh at the snow or at the time to come because although the time to come is uncertain, she has made preparation for it in all the ways that she can, she can think of. She's an industrious woman. Furthermore, she's business savvy, and I hesitate to use that language, but I think it's, it's appropriate. This woman obviously has some marketable skills, Verse 22, she makes herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple, so she can make clothes. She, she can make nice clothes, she, and she does for herself. But then verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. She has some skills. She's, she's not confined to the four walls of her home. She goes outside of the home to use her skills for the sake of the home. I think that's important to emphasize. If you have a marketable skill, women, God's word does not discourage you from using it. God gifted you with talents and abilities to use them for his glory and to bless your husband and children with them is not a sin. Yes, be keepers at home, but there's a season when women expand beyond that. And it's obvious that the woman in this passage prioritized her marriage and her children and her household and her business savvy, to use that language, serve the welfare of her marriage and family. Furthermore, we all know by experience that unexpected things come up in life. And for a woman as a wife and mother too, to have a skill that can be used outside the home, gives a line of retreat in the event of disaster. And provides a help to the family in times when that may be necessary. This woman uses her abilities in her industry. She's industrious. That was a long section. Now we come to number three. She is generous. And these two things go together. She is a good and godly woman, remember. So her industry and what she does with her hands and in her work she does not keep selfishly to herself or for her family. But verse 20 says, she stretches out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hands to the needy. She's aware of those around her and what they need. She presents herself to those who are oppressed by the misfortunes of life as if she says, I will do what I can with my hands according to my abilities to help you. You have my handshake on it. She offers sympathy and counsel and encouragement. She's eager to help others. The idea is that she stretches out her hand. She doesn't just throw a gift or a donation at someone and hope that it sticks, but she gives to the needy to experience her warm sympathy.
God takes Israel to task in Ezekiel 16, verse 49, for not doing this. God says in that verse, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride and fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. This woman, the virtuous woman, the godly and good woman, does. And that may look different in our time than it did in Bible times or in the Old Old Testament, but the principle is the same. It may mean having someone over for dinner or dropping off groceries for someone you know is having a rough month or driving someone without a car to work or to the doctor's office or volunteering But no matter what you do, it is out of love for God and for the help of the needy and the poor, beggars whom God has placed in your life and in mine to open our hands to as he has opened his hand to us. She is helpful to the poor and needy and along with that, is the fact that she does not eat the bread of idleness, verse 27. She doesn't do everything that needs to be done for her home and family and then sit on Facebook or on social media the rest of the time and idly involve herself in the lives of others. But she goes out and helps those who are poor and needy. She seeks opportunities to be a blessing and an encouragement and a help to others. Number four, this, she is strong and dignified. She's a strong woman, verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She is, isn't ruled by emotions. She isn't always fearless, but she has courage. She isn't afraid of the future because she knows that she's done what she can to prepare for it. She knows and she knows her God and that he is trustworthy. And she carries herself with respect as one who is to be respected. In other words, she's not prone to gossip or unwise venting of her emotions because that's undignified. She understands the value of self-control. She has the meekness of restrained power. And as a strong person, she chooses restraint because it is the wiser course of action and not the easier one. A woman of strength and dignity. And finally, number six, she is a woman who watches her mouth who uses her tongue to build and not to throw down. Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She knows when to speak and when to be silent. She makes choices with wisdom and not with emotion. When we use our words, this applies to all of us, but now to are virtuous women in particular, when you use your words, you are either building up or tearing down. Are the things leaving your mouth encouraging to your husband, building up the hearts of your children, encouraging them when they are discouraged? Do your words spur your friends toward Jesus and not call attention to yourself? Do you teach those around you with kindness, remembering the kindness of God's word to us in Christ? It starts at home. When you speak to your husband about something that bothers you, is your tongue ruled by kindness? When you correct your children, is it to encourage them toward godliness? or guilt them toward shame. The virtuous woman understands that words can mold souls or crush hearts. 
and she knows when to be silent. So a trustworthy, industrious, generous, dignified, and word-watching woman. These six characteristics, and there are more, remember, are not something innate. These are the fruit of the Lord's work in her. These are not something that is a to-do list, but these are the virtues of sanctification that have been bought by Christ and applied through the Holy Spirit. And these are the characteristics of a woman who has a reward in this life and in the life to come. Her reward in time is found in verse 28 and 29. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. And now verse 29 is the praising words of the husband to his wife. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Her children are ready to stand up and to bless her, to commend her, to thank her. And now, children, here's where you get brought into the picture. Do you bless your moms? Do you bless your grandmas too, but your moms especially for all the work that they do? Do you thank them for being women who your dads can trust in, hard workers at home and outside the home for the sake of your family? Do you thank your moms for being generous to you and for showing you how to be generous to others? For giving an example of strength and for teaching you how to use your mouths and tongues with wisdom and kindness. Do you thank your mother's children for all that they do? Do you bless them with gratitude? And then from her husband, the virtuous woman receives praise. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. And here's the word to us husbands. Do we say this to our wives? Perhaps not in these words, but do we make it clear to them before our children and in private that we do not doubt that God has given many good and virtuous women to his church, many good and godly women, but that the wife he's given to us is the best of them all that your wife's price is far above rubies and that nothing in this world can be compared to her. Now you understand, this reward is not certain. Mothers, wives and mothers, you know that. Your children are always thankful their husbands, although we do try, do not always appreciate you as we ought. That is to our shame, for which we pray God to forgive us. Sometimes the sounds coming from your children sound like cursing rather than blessing, and the praises of your husband may be non-existent or may sound like words meant to hurt rather than to build up but you do have a reward of the Lord. And that is found in the last two verses. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is the gospel. This is God recognizing his own work of grace in the women he has loved before time, whom he sent Christ to die for, whom, whose blood cleanses his daughters from all sin, and whose Holy Spirit animates them, 
unto fear of the Lord and the practice of godliness. God recognizes his own work of grace in you. Beloved, excellent women whom he has given to our homes and families. And God is not unfaithful to forget his work in you and through you in your labor of love. And this is where the book of Proverbs ends, with God's reward, God's word of blessing on the faithful wife and mother, and God's word of promise holding forth the eternal reward of glory that he will bestow according to his grace on all his beloved daughters. So lift up your hearts to the Lord. Trust in him safely and surely, knowing that the woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word. Bless it to all of our hearts, but especially to the hearts and lives of the wives and mothers and single young women gathered here this evening. Strengthen them in thy fear. Build them up in the hope and in the assurance that thou dost look upon them. Thou dost call them blessed. Thou dost praise them not because of who they are in themselves, but because of who they are by thy grace. Give us grace as husbands and give grace to our children. Once again, we pray to call our excellent women blessed and to praise them for thy glory and the honor of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.